kind of going into these or uh, insect in, into the insect world and the world of organic insecticides. There's a lot to learn. Um, in the past, I've done almost two hour sessions at meetings like Southern SOG or Georgia Organics, just on insecticide. There's so much to learn. Uh, so this is my basic framework that I'm going to give you today, just basic recommendations and, uh, and show you some resources because this is a constant process. It, it's not never ending process. Um, and um, feel free to call us or the regional extension agents uh, through the phone app, the Farming Basics phone app, and uh, get more updated information. Uh, you have all my information on your screen. And uh, um, David, let me know if, if, any, if there's any disruption um, on my, my end. But, uh, um, and I think Harley is monitoring the social media chat. So you guys can put your questions in the chat. Uh, but my information is on your screen. Uh, we do have a IPM a Sustainable Ag e-newsletter, a team newsletter, which is on your screen. Make sure you are subscribed to it. Don't miss out on important pest alerts or crop alerts uh, like the ones you just heard from and you have been hearing through this series. Um, we also have the um, Alabama Extension Commercial Horde channel on Facebook, uh, where we put a lot of things. We also have a vegetable IPM. Uh, web uh, a channel on Facebook. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Alabama IPM. And we have an Instagram farming underscore basics. Um, so just make sure you're using these resources and the, the phone app. Of course, everything kind of culminates in the phone app uh, if you're using it. Now, um, as I said, there's a lot of information and I have done these smaller uh, pieces of our smaller videos, shorter videos for you to watch and watch again. Uh, so there's many videos that are linked through the phone app, the Farming Basics phone app, or you can look for the Alabama Beginning Farmer playlist on YouTube. Uh, we have over a hundred videos now. So it's an incredible amount of information and short uh, uh, segments along with some of the detailed ones. There's one on uh, insecticide or pesticide calibration that uh, David Lawrence has done, um, you should look at. So there are some really uh, great videos in there uh, that provide uh, lots of good information. So make sure you're you are, uh, using these, uh, these videos uh, in future. Uh, we also have print resources and I know there are some person from abroad who may not be able to get these uh, but uh, if you are in Alabama or the Southeast, if you come to one of our field events, uh, in-person events, you can collect uh, the vegetable handbook, make sure you're using the most recent one. We've also updated our slide chart, which is your organic, uh, kind of your entry point to organic systems. And I always recommend producers, gardeners to call me with this uh, IPM slide chart in hand. Uh, and the new ones are blue color. Um, and again, we also have one for urban farms market gardeners uh, that is available. So just reach out to us and we'll try to get it to you uh, uh, or you can come get them from an event near you. Now, um, over these last few sessions I've done, there were questions from home gardeners. And uh, uh, the last one I did, I mentioned that I'm going to show you how I do gardening, and I'm not perfect, uh, as you can tell. Uh, but here's my attempt uh, in growing some of the more exotic vegetables, these Indian vegetables, because that makes my gardening more cost effective. So I try to grow things you can't get at Walmart or um, Publix or somewhere else. So some of these uh, uh, unusual vegetables, and you can kind of see uh, I have a, a, a small trellis uh, that is full of gourds. Um, I grew about, last year I grew about 60 pounds, I think, of backyard vegetables. And I know a lot of gardeners are on this call, so you might be tickled with this. I am actually, I've taken down the trellis and rebuilding an entire trellis. I bought a greenhouse frame uh, for my house and I'm gonna use that as a trellis this year to grow my Indian vegetables and have more open canopy. Uh, I also grow um, the Indian long beans and Malabar spinach. Uh, the one thing I've understood, and you can again relate back to everything that Andre has presented today 
and in the past, uh, you know, the things he has mentioned, for example, uh, from gardening and production perspective, timing, um, you know, of your planting and harvest of your crop, very important. Um, so the more you delay your planting, the more your harvesting is delayed, there's more insect pressure. So it's all related. Uh, irrigation watering that Andre just talked about. I do not like to irrigate with uh, overhead. I actually have micro irrigation system and uh, soaker hose in my garden. So, and I regulate the water. I only water twice a day for a certain period of time. And that has really benefited my crop. Um, and then trellising, I don't like to put things on the ground. I'm one of those gardeners who likes to put most of the things up on a trellis if I can. Of course, sometimes if you're growing watermelons and pumpkins, like big ones, you can't do that. So that's logical, but I would put all my smaller vegetables up on trellises and, um, and support them somehow. So the whole idea is uh, to open the canopy where you can spray if needed, uh, and avoid some of the hiding spots because insects love this crowded um, uh, when you crowd them. So this is very important. So again, follow the recommendations that you see on a seed packet. Those are uh, research-based. Um, a lot of them are research-based. So follow that. Uh, so just wanted to kind of show you what I do. And here's some of the yields. Uh, and you can see, you know, during COVID, uh, I was able to grow uh, quite a bit of vegetables from a small area in my backyard. So uh, again, it's the, you have to design a system that works for you and you can manage them. Um, all right, so jumping into the pest management part, and of course, if you have questions, I'm sure I'm gonna leave you with more questions than answers today. Um, just type them in the chat and I'll try to answer them slowly. But uh, let me get on and talk about pest management or IPM. And essentially it starts from insect detection and monitoring. And I've covered some of these in my earlier presentations in the series on tomatoes, on cucurbits. So just take a look at those. Um, but I want to move on quickly today because, and then cover some more new ground. Um, so it starts with insect, IPM starts with insect detection monitoring, uh, insect identification, very important. Uh, don't kill the good bugs, uh, go after the bad ones. So try to learn and, and document. Um, on, on your phone, you can actually save the image and tag them with a title. So you can, you know what insect you have seen and how you've identified it or use the uh, phone apps like our Farming Basics phone app has most of the critical insects you need to look for. Uh, know the population pressure, know when to act. Um, for example, if you have just one aphid, there's no reason uh, to go out and spray. Uh, and that's called the economic threshold. So you, you have to watch and see what the insects are doing and how the symptoms are happening and control them timely. Uh, so that's the concept of economic threshold. Natural enemy, take into account your natural enemies, uh, protect them and use insecticides only if needed. Remember, I'm not trying to sell you insecticides today. Uh, I'm trying to tell you that we have other methods of uh, pest management and then insecticides. And uh, this is again a slide I've used again and again and again, because I think this is very important to realize that in the organic world, our uh, sustainable ag side, there are different ways of managing insects. It doesn't have to be always insecticides. And this is true even in the conventional uh, systems. So we have the three levels of IPM or integrated pest management, which is the first one is the systems-based practices. And those are everything that Andre talked about irrigation, choice of varieties, uh, sanitation and weed control, very important. Uh, I have talked about trap cropping in my previous talk. Um, again, that's another way of, of uh, doing ecological diversity, confusing the insect. And again, that's a prevention strategy. Pest exclusion is very important. And I think that uh, can be done by small farmers, market gardeners. Um, and they certainly, uh, if you've not tried it, give it a try look at the videos and learn from them and call us before you, you try to implement it on large acres if you have a large farm. So, uh, because these pest exclusion systems can get expensive. Um, all right, so, um, uh, sorry, I, I had a message 
pop up on my screen. Um, so the pest exclusion system is level two, and then you have insecticides. And again, our goal is to protect nature, uh, protect, protect those pollinators and natural enemies. Going deeper into, uh, oops, there. Going deeper into the, uh, the organic or sustainable ag side of things, uh, you know, not all tools are made for everybody. For example, if you are an open field producer or you have a large garden, you can use preventive tactics like trap cropping. Trap crops take time, they take space. Not everybody has space, certainly I don't. Um, so um, you can use it if you have land. Uh, but if you are a high tunnel producer, you can use the permanent exclusion system, uh, which is on your in the middle of your screen. Uh, and basically something like a shade cloth, which is a cheap pest exclusion system. Uh, and if you're a home gardener, market gardener, you can use these fixed frame or movable frame pest exclusion systems. And again, the cost depends on how much you want to invest. Uh, so, uh, but these things are uh, very effective. Uh, I have uh, many years of data and I'm still learning from it. It's not perfect, but I think we have some very good recommendations. Now, here's a quick reminder, always, as you garden or farm, take a look at the weather and how the patterns are shifting. For example, know that there are different types of drought. Uh, we have the prolonged drought, which we saw in 2016. I remember it when I had to actually buy tanker of water and irrigate and uh, all the, uh, the ponds went dry and we had to buy water. Um, compared that to the 2019 summer, uh, we had a flash drought where we had a very intense few weeks of absolutely no rainfall, intense temperatures, and that helped the insects. And you can see those, the arrows indicate the population fluctuations and the, pop, and the insects took advantage of it. The crops were stressed and I, my, my crops looked horrible uh, that year. So I think the flash drought hurts us more than prolonged drought where we can prepare better. Uh, and then of course we have wet, very wet years like last year, it was extremely wet. And we had more disease issues than trying to control the insects. Uh, so again, take a look at uh, the weather and make your IPM plans flexible uh, and keep talking to us uh, uh, with for data or any information you need. Also, as I said before, don't kill the um, good bugs the beneficial insects and pollinators. We need them. And this slide shows that don't go by color of these insects. For example, uh, on the left of your screen, uh, you're looking at this uh, sting bug, which is actually a beneficial insect. And it has a very thick and stout proboscis or mouth. It's like a straw, it's a thick straw. And it's short and it's sharp because it's a predator. It's gonna pinch the body of a caterpillar and kill it and suck the juice out. Um, and then compare that with the one on the right, uh, that's a pest uh, sting bug. And it has a long straw, long beak-like mouth. And uh, uh, so you should be, you know, you should identify these insects and not freak out. Uh, we don't want to kill these, these good insects. So identification is critical. If you send pictures to us, remember to take pictures from different angles. Oftentimes I get pictures from just the top of the insect. It's very difficult for me to tell unless there's a specific pattern. Um, try to move your camera to the side so that I can see the mouth parts and even the legs. Uh, some of these features help us identify the insects better. So, um, and take good pictures, good quality pictures if you can. Going into the world of organic insecticides, and this is what you are here for, uh, there are so many choices today. And, how do you define it though? Um, you know, there are there's different definitions from the academic world. There's also definitions from the insecticide industry itself. For example, uh, Valent Biosciences has a definition that includes biorational products as products that are from natural or biological origins. And also other things like crop stress reducers, 
um, and other plant growth promoters, and they include those into the into this as well. So there's a pretty broad category uh, bi of birational pesticides out there, but bioinsecticides uh, are kind of specific and um, uh, typically they're derived from natural sources. If you think about uh, BT, you think about the botanicals like neem that you may be using, um, they are typically non-persistent in the environment, which means they don't accumulate uh, like some of the other pesticides do. They, if you apply them, they're active for a few days and then they kind of go out or they're washed out. Uh, and that's the whole idea is to, is to uh, do a quick shot, get the insect, and it's not persistent on the produce. And uh, if you are organic, you have, you have to look for the OMRI, O-M-R-I symbol on the product label. And I have that on the screen. And OMRI, O-M-R-I stands for Organic Materials Research Institute. Uh, so look for OMRI. Uh, don't go for the uh, products that are labeled anything but OMRI if, you are a, if you're an organic producer. You need to stay within the limits. Um, And again, if you go to an, a store, uh, this is what you may see. It's a mess out there. It's very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to really understand uh, which one is a bioinsecticide and which one is a chemical. Uh, so um, use these uh, slide charts that I've shown you, the other publications we have, and, uh, or the phone app. We're going to launch a new Farming Basics phone app that will have the organic recommendations in it and uh, use these facilities or these resources as you shop uh, for insecticides. So be very careful what you buy. I know this is an overwhelming slide, but uh, this is one I want to take some time on is, is there are, and I'll go through this, um, some more details uh, in the future slides, but there are about four different categories of organic insecticides. Uh, for example, the first one on the top says physical desiccants that includes kaolin clay, diatomaceous earth. If you think about those products, you know, these are physical you have products. So you have to apply it over the insect and it may irritate or dehydrate the insect and kill them. Uh, the problem there is they also get washed out easily. And you may have seen that. Uh, but uh, and the other thing is they also may wear out nozzles on your um on your sprayers. So uh, there's good and bad of, of all these products, but physical desiccants, they are physical poisons. The big majority of insecticides today belong to contact uh, action. And that's in the middle of your screen there, which includes oils, neem. I think you all uh, love neem. Uh, I go with uh, neem that has azadirectin, which is the active ingredient in it. Uh, and it's on your screen, uh, pyganic or pyrethrin, and there are a number of other things, even including fungi or fungi. I don't know how you say it. Uh, maybe it's fungi. So, uh, but there are these fungi, these uh, these products that are contact poisons. So they have to be applied over the skin of insect, and then they go into the uh, cuticle of the insect, and they destroy the insect. So uh, those include Bavaria, Metarhizium, and Paracelomyces. You'll see those scientific names on there, and those are. Uh, fungal products. Uh, and there's also some others. Uh, now, one interesting thing I have, I, I'll point out on this slide, there are premixes coming out in the market. So in the organic world, a new trend is uh, industry uh, products with one, uh, with two or more, typically two, two products mixed together. For example, you can see Botanic Guard Max, uh, which has the Bavaria, which is a fungus, along with pyetic mixed together. So it's already mixed for you and makes it more powerful, more effective. Uh, Azera is neem and pyetic mixed together. So it's very interesting to see a lot of these new products uh, coming up with uh, multiple active ingredients, uh, which increases the cost for, and it may be cost prohibitive for gardeners, but for farmers, it's certainly uh, could be helpful um, uh, to especially plan your IPM uh, insecticide sprays. Then the next big, the most famous insecticide in the world is the BT products. Uh, that's the Bacillus thuringiensis product like Dipel and Zentari. 
And again, you see the, uh, the new premix products of BT coming out in the market. Um, the last one on the bottom of the screen are the, are the volatiles. Uh, I have started to do some research on the volatile uh, products. For example, the Bra Dr. Bronner's peppermint. It's really amazing. Like when you are spraying it all like minty around you. So it smells really nice when you spray. But um, here's the danger. Um, these products are great when, say for small insects like aphids, uh, they will dehydrate the insect, uh, but they, you, you should not spray them when it's too hot. It can cause plant burn. Uh, and also uh, spray these, use most of these products when the insects are small or low in numbers. If you already have an outbreak, these products will struggle to give you the result you're, you want. So again, scouting is very important, that's why. Um, and then I have on the on the far right of the screen, I have included some of the granular products. Uh, there's not very many out there, uh, but I have included some that act as uh, for fire ant control, for cutworms, and also for slugs. If we get into another very wet year, like last year, we may see slugs and snails on our crop. So again, these products are out there. The slug products are not very cost effective if you're a farmer. Uh, so that's the danger again. So make sure you're planting uh, in good ground that drains properly. Um, and, uh, uh, but there are some choices. I just wanted to kind of mention these, these uh, the, the whole gamut of organic uh, products in, in one slide for you. And uh, I may be uh, omitting something, but that's typically what you will see when you go out to, to shop for organic insect sites or online. And uh, talking of where you can get some insect sites, uh, here are some choices. Uh, there are egg retailers. You can buy them from directly, especially make friends with your farmer's co-op around you. Uh, those co-op guys, uh, most of them have an agriculture background. They are there for the long term. Uh, they will talk to you and, and help you uh, seek some answers, perhaps connect to us. Uh, but you can also buy online organic insects that are, most of it is now being sold online. So uh, it's, the, but if you're buying online, one of the things I wanted to mention is check the expiry on these products when you buy them from anywhere um, and, and make sure the product comes with labels. Don't buy products that have a missing label. Um, because if you apply too much of these organic things that you can burn the crop, uh, especially in our Alabama heat. Um, and then store these biopesticides away from sunlight. Don't let them get hot and boiling because for example, Bt, uh, Bt is a living insecticide. It will, the bacteria will just die. So don't uh, do that and always make a fresh mixture when you're spraying. Uh, so just some, some things to think about. None of this is, is rocket science here. Uh, it's very, very basic, very logical. Let's talk quickly about some of the microbial products. Uh, so again, this is BT. Um, you may have seen this in different versions. There's a liquid version. There's also the uh, dry flowable versions um, that are available and you can buy them online or on at the co-op. Um, now, uh, BT is very good for caterpillars. So if you're writing notes, this is a very good material for caterpillars, um, especially Zentari that's on the screen here. That's very good for army worms, uh, if you're wondering if you have army worms. But you need to spray more frequently. We do sprays minimum once a week. If you have a high pressure, I would go with two, twice a week. So again, the point is don't stop spraying too soon. Uh, go and spray, see the effect, and if needed, spray again. And make sure you're doing a thorough uh, application uh, with good amount of water. Um, so. Um, again, very effective products, lots of choices today uh, for farmers and home gardeners. This is the fungal product. It's an insect uh, fungus that at attacks insects. And the OMRI approved, the organic version is called Mycotrol, uh, but the older product, another product is called Botanigard. Um, and again, these are, it's a contact poison. And uh, these are again, very good when the insects are small or low in numbers. Uh, a lot of these products are very popular with greenhouse producers. 
Uh, this is metaresium. This is again another fungus. It's a little hard to get some years. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, I, I did my PhD on, on this product. It's a great product. Uh, it's called the green muscadine fungus because it makes the insect green and kills them. So, and it's really good on small insects uh, and uh, has, a, has a good contact action. Uh, and you can buy this online. I've, I've bought my uh, products online, but again, check the expiry um, because sometimes it's hard to get. This is a, a kind of a less known product, but uh, we have done some research on it. Uh, this is a, another fungus uh, that is a, a factor for some insects. We have tried this on um, beetles. Uh, if it's, again, small insects, uh, I, I would not use it for large insects or high pressures, uh, but it is made by a very good company called Certus, uh, PFR97. So, uh, again, we are evaluating this for yellow margin leaf beetle, which is a major pest right now in the winters uh, or in the in, in spring. Uh, this is another uh, category, uh, it, the viruses. And uh, they're, because they're so specific, a lot of people don't use it. But these viruses are great because they, for example, this one will only control uh, the caterpillars. and. Uh, the corn earworms, it would not touch any other insects. So if you're looking for specificity, then viruses are the way to go. Um, again, they don't last very long. This is like Bt. You have to treat them just like Bt. So like Bt is for caterpillars only, same thing with these viruses. But these are good products. We have tried them. And uh, our challenge is, is the drought. If we get into an extremely drought situation, some of these products may, may deteriorate uh, faster. So. Uh, but uh, these are some of the choices that you have for microbials. And then nematodes. Uh, we have been doing some work with nematodes, especially for mole crickets, and uh, putting them as drench in the ground, and uh, trying to uh, control some of the soil-based uh, insects like cutworms, um, mole crickets. Um, I don't have data on Japanese beetles and grubs, but uh, Certainly, uh, there are different types, and you see it on your screen. There's the ambush type and the hunting type. So, again, it's a it's very interesting. Once you start to dive into these uh, different biologicals, uh, there's so much to learn there. Quickly about botanicals, and this is one of the most favorite categories for with, for gardeners. Uh, the neem-based insecticides. Uh, remember, there are two forms. There's one oil form, which is very common, but it does not have azadirectin, which is the active ingredient. Uh, I like the ones that have the azadirectin. So look at the label and uh, then make your purchase decision. Um, so again, use these for small insects like caterpillars, white flies. It does really well for white flies. And they do work really well in covered situations like high tunnels or greenhouses. Uh, when the, the, the action is extended. So, uh, so neem-based insects are suddenly very popular and sometimes they struggle in our trials because of the excessive heat and uh, constant moisture, constant rainfall. Uh, it's, it's a struggle to keep them on. Pyganic is one of the most popular botanical in the world and one of the oldest. Um, so again, this is a, 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 an extract from the chrysanthemum flowers. Uh, try not to mix it with anything. Uh, there are some really good premixes now, uh, but don't mix it with soap. So that's one of the things, soap will deteriorate uh, this uh, form formulation. Uh, but you can mix pyganic with say Bt. And we have done it and we have got some good, really good results with some of the crops. Uh, but watch out, don't, overdo it, uh, don't burn your crop uh, with high rates. So just be on the lookout. Uh, but pyganic is a very good broad spectrum insecticide. Uh, so again, this is the pyganic and different versions. There's a organic and a non-organic version that's on your screen. So read the label before you, you apply. Some of the uh, microbial derivatives, which means that these don't have the active microbe they are extracted, the poison is extracted from those microbes, uh, but they, there's no active microbe in there. And one of the best example of it is spinosad. Uh, and this is a very expensive product. So, uh, and trust, uh, which comes in different forms, 
uh, formulations. Um, it's a pricey product. So this is kind of that last, last thing. If you have an intense pressure of caterpillars or, or small beetles, uh, and trust, uh, I put in trust in the, in the rotation. Uh, but this is my last resort. There's also a home garden version. And what I found out is you have to spray more often. Uh, so it does have the spinosad in there, uh, but you, you end up spraying more often. So um, again, this is kind of the more expensive uh, versions uh, that are out there uh, if you're interested. And I always say to farmers that, you know, take insecticide not, not as a cost, but as an expense, because you will get a return if you invest. So it depends how much you want to invest, uh, but you have to do this as a, in, as a plan. Uh, Grandivo is another new one. Uh, well, it's not new anymore, but some years back when I first started working with Grandivo, it used to be a new one. Again, it's a, it's a derivative um, from a bacterium and uh, it's OMRI approved and it does have a broad action uh, for small caterpillars, small insects like aphids, thrips, white flies, and also spider mites. Um, and it does not kill the beneficial insects. So it's a, uh, it's a good product. It's still under testing. I keep, I keep uh, doing things with Grandivo and the same company makes Venerate. Um, it's Venerate struggles a little bit with in you know, our trials, especially in high pest conditions. Uh, so this is kind of a work in progress, um, but it is available. Uh, just wanted to make you aware of the, some of these products. Soaps and oils, I know you all love these. Uh, these are the insect cell soap. This soap is different from your Dawn detergent. So here's my, uh, uh, my opinion about Dawn detergent. It's not labeled as an insecticide. So if you are using Dawn detergent, you're on your own. And if you use too much of it, you can burn your plant. And I've done that. That's why I'm saying from experience. These insect cell soaps that you see on screen, these are potassium salts, they would not burn and they're labeled for the crop. So just be aware of this and remember not to mix most of these other products you saw with a soap. Soap deteriorates products. So when I use soap, I really wash out the sprayer and then use other products. Uh, so I don't try to mix anything with soap when I'm using it. But soap is a kind of a, it's weak when you have a lot of aphids, a lot of white flies, um, obviously, because and, and you need fresh coverage. So, you know, the product will just stay where you spray it. So any new uh, vegetation, you have to spray again. So you have to keep spraying. It also washes away fast. So, uh, uh, but it's a very popular product with organic producers and, and it helps uh, to relieve some of the pressure. Uh, these are some of the petroleum oils. Uh, I have done a lot of research on Suffoil, which is on the bottom of your screen. So all, uh, these are good for spider mites, white flies, some of the small insects. Uh, one of the good things about petroleum-based oils, it, it kind of just smell like gas or kerosene, um, but these, they mix really well with water. They form a very good suspension um, and they also act as uh, antifungal. Uh, so some of them have a pretty broad label, but uh, uh, yeah, this is, uh, if you haven't tried, these are certainly, Worthwhile. I don't know what packaging they come on because last I checked, they seem to be in big packaging, but they may be available for home gardeners uh, for in small packaging. And then we have these vegetable oils um, that are available and Piola, which is on your screen, that's a premix. So again, uh, we're kind of trying to synthesize everything that you saw. Uh, I get this question all the time. What are the top six Organic insecticides for vegetable gardeners, market gardeners. Well, it's this is on your screen now. There's the top five are BT, Dipel for caterpillars, Pyganic for broad spectrum insect control, especially go after the small worms and the small sting bugs. Don't expect miracles uh, with any of these products. Spinosad, again, that's an expensive product use it as in rotation with some of the other products. Uh, neem um, with azadirectin, uh, that uh, prohibits insects from molting. It's also anti-feedant action. And I think I mentioned about the insect cell soap, that how it is different from your home 
dishwashing soap. And then kaolin clay, I've seen that being used. Uh, the only thing is they don't, it doesn't uh, last very long. They will wash away easily, but it acts as a, as a repellent. So you have this top five, six products that I have tried, uh, and I still try these for different insects. Um, and then of course, these pre-mixes are in the market. Now, I will again remind you that, you know, insect sets alone, uh, the organic insect sets alone may not be all effective. Try to integrate them with different other methods. For example, uh, here you're looking at a picture on the left is if you do nothing to these tomatoes. So if you just let the insects do their thing, you can see the tremendous damage from caterpillars and sting bugs uh, or leaf footed bugs. And uh, compare that if you use something like a trap crop and then use, um, uh, just use the trap cropping, for example. So you see some effect and the pictures tell the story, right? So, uh, and these, in this case, the trap crop is, is sorghum NK300 and peridobic sunflower. Again, go back to the YouTube channel I mentioned and look up those older videos all the web or the webinar series before, and you may so so that you can get the whole story about trap cropping, uh, because that's a that's an entire session I can do on trap crops. But you can see the difference if you do nothing, then you do something. For example, trap cropping. The next slide I'll so, show you if you did trap cropping and use insecticides, whether it's a organic insecticide or a conventional, you have a remarkable. Uh, it can make a remarkable difference by integrating these various tactics. And, uh, and again, this comes from experience. It may not work the first year, it may not work the second year, but as you gain more experience on integrating these tactics, you will start noticing the difference it makes. Uh, it took me many, many, many years to learn this and show you, uh, but there is a benefit. And again, if you are using pest exclusion system with BT, so now you can see uh, uh, these are pictures from one of our uh, experimental studies where we're doing uh, on-farm research uh, with producer with pest exclusion system on high tunnels. And the producer used the pest exclusion system along with BT and there is the insect dead from BT infection. So it's really amazing to, uh, if you are able to integrate these different tactics. That's why the, the word IPM if you're a producer, this might be of interest to you. Uh, you can do tank mixing with insecticides. For example, for caterpillars, you can use BT with pyganic. You can also uh, mix neem with pyganic. So there's different ways you can do these, uh, these combinations. Again, I have not done research on every crop that's out there. And in Alabama, I think we grow about 34 different vegetables. There's no way I can ever do research on every crop please, please, please make sure you don't burn your crop. So when you do this, if you try these, do it on a small area, few plants and see the effect and then spray the entire field. Um, so again, if you have caterpillars, remember to start with BT. BT works really well in the organic situation and then go to some of the other products like Pyganic or Neem. Um, if you're using insecticide rotations, again, in the bottom of the screen, I've mentioned for caterpillars, BT is great, but if you have, say, beetles, you can try something like Pyganic or Azera, which is a premix, and, and start with those and then go to BT. So again, make your decision based on your insects. Not a, This is not a calendar-based spraying. Um, so those schedules don't work. So again, I, I think I already covered some of these. Uh, there are some insect set premixes. I think I've seen smaller packaging for these products. So even home gardeners can buy these products now. Uh, so again, um, yes, so these are uh, just kind of repeat uh, slides. Now, a lot of people, I'm kind of towards the end of my presentation. A uh, lot of people ask me about fire ants. Make sure you are checking that it is fire ant. Uh, I think the test is called a Pareto chip test. So basically throw a Pareto chip on the, on the ant hill and see if the ants get it. So you need the ants to actively feeding to let the insecticide work. But there are some choices that are organic and not 
non-organic. Uh, for example, uh, payback and come and get it. These are all kind of funny names for insecticides, but you can buy them online on Amazon. Uh, Monterey has just released uh, kind of a new product. I saw it before the COVID pandemic hit. So it's almost two years now. And I saw the Monterey ant control pellets, uh, but it does not control fire ants. So again, read the label. Uh, Sidious bait from Certus is OMRI approved and it's for producers. And there are some other uh, baits as well that I have mentioned. Uh, so there are some choices and there's a blog article where you can read more. So if you go to aces.edu, type in fire ant control and you should be able to get to my detailed article. And then if we get into a very rainy, wet weather, be ready for seeing snails uh, on your crop. And the earlier you spray or earlier you apply any of the, these molluscicides, which is the pesticides, the better. Um, but the challenge is cost. These ma majority of these products are very expensive and I'm almost sure farmers may not be doing it. Uh, and it's, you just have to have good ground and, uh, and ha not have too much rain uh, if you can exclude rain. Uh, but there are some, some uh, things that you can buy in large packaging. And I've mentioned some of those that those might be available for farmers. Remember to check your sprayer. So don't uh, delay buying good sprayers, get good quality sprayers from a local co-op, check the nozzle. Um, I have tried some of the battery operated sprayers. I have tried at least two of them and I found this Flowmaster Pumpless, which is just 35 bucks, really effective for home garden spraying. I, I actually use it even for my, my lawn spraying if I have to do spot spraying on the lawns. So it gets you a very good uh, spray pressure, a uniform sp pressure. Again, I'm a gardener, so I'm not necessarily following everything, but I, I know it's doing a good job and it's not dripping insecticides and I'm not wasting material. Uh, ideally, if you're a farmer, I would say go calibrate. Um, but if you have a good battery, they come with rechargeable batteries, it works great. And then try to spray from bottom up, not from top down the way usual way we think, so that you have the insecticide. So when you are getting this insecticide with your sprayer, uh, if you have an angled nozzle, spray it from bottom to up so that you can deposit these insecticides underneath the leaf where the insects are hiding. So uh, that helps the organic products, that helps the persistence of these products. So just think about it. Uh, and, and do your own experiment and see what works for you. I think this is my last slide. Um, just wanted to <coughs> remind you again that uh, we have the IPM Sustainable Ag newsletter. Don't miss out on information because that's the number one problem is we have worked really hard to get you information, uh, but during summers, don't miss out on pest alerts and, and, and even crop alerts. Um, use the online Course, farming basics online course uh, for beginning farmers and then use the apps and these uh, online social media events to interact with us uh, that's the reason we, we are doing this uh, so with that i am going to stop